Reading of Fiction by Edith Wharton Order the beauty even of beauty is Thomas Trahern Charles Scribner's Sons, New York, London, 1925 Copyright 1924-1925 by Charles Scribner's Sons Copyright 1925 by the Yale Publishing Association, Incorporated, printed in the United States of America, to Gaylord Lapsley. Contents, one, in general, two, telling a short story, three, constructing a novel, four, character and situation in the novel, five, Marcel Proust. The writing of fiction. One, in general. To treat of the practice of fiction is to deal with the newest, most fluid, and least formulated of the arts. The exploration of origins is always fascinating, but the attempt to relate the modern novel to the tale of Joseph and his brethren is of purely historic interest. Modern fiction really began when the action of the novel was transferred from the street to the soul, and this step was probably first taken when Madame de la Fayette, in the 17th century, wrote a little story called The Princess de Cleves, a story of hopeless love and mute renunciation in which the stately tenor of the lives depicted is hardly ruffled by the exultations and agonies succeeding each other below the surface. The next advance was made when the protagonist of the inner drama was transformed from conventionalized puppets, the hero, the heroine, the villain, the heavy father, and so on, into breathing and recognizable human beings. Here again, a French novelist, the Abbe Prevost, led the way with Manor Le Scout, but his drawing of characters seems summary and schematic when his people are compared with the first great figure in modern fiction, the appalling Niveau de Raymond. It was not till long after Diderot's death that the author of so many brilliant tales peopled with 18th century puppets was found. In this creation of that one sordid, cynical, and desolately human figure to have anticipated not only Balzac but Dostoevsky. But even from Manon Lescaut and the Niveau de Remont, even from Le Sage, Defoe, Fielding, Smollett, Richardson, and Scott, modern fiction is differentiated by the great dividing geniuses of Balzac and Stendhal. Save for that one amazing accident of Diderot's, Balzac was the first not only to see his people physically and morally in their habit as they lived, with all of their personal hobbies and infirmities and make the reader see them, but to draw his dramatic action as much from the relation of the characters to their houses, streets, towns, professions, inherited habits and opinions, as from their fortuitous contacts with each other. Olzak himself ascribed the priority in this kind of realism to Scott, for whom the younger novelist avowedly derived his chief inspiration. But, as Balzac observed, Scott, so keen and direct in surveying the rest of his field of vision, became conventional and hypocritical when he touched on love and women. In deference to the wave of prudery which overswept England after the vulgar excess of the Hanoverian court, he substituted sentimentality for passion and reduced his heroines to keepsake insipidities. Whereas in the firm surface of Balzac's realism, there is hardly a flaw, and his women, the young as well as the old, are living people, as much compact of human contradictions and torn with human passions as his missers, his financiers, his priests, or his doctors. Stendhal, though as indifferent as any 18th century writer to atmosphere and local color, is intensely modern and realistic in the individualizing of his characters, who were never types to the extent even of some of Balzac's, but always sharply differentiated and particular human beings. 
More distinctively still does he represent the new fiction by his insight into the springs of social action. No modern novelist has ever gone nearer than Racine did in his tragedies to the sources of personal, of individual feeling, and some of the French novelists of the 18th century are still unsurpassed, save by Racine, in the last refinements of individual soul analysis. What was new in both Balzac and Stendhal was the fact of their viewing each character first of all as a product of particular material and social conditions, as being thus or thus because of the calling he pursued or the house he lived in, Balzac or the society he wanted to get into, Stendhal, or the acre of ground he coveted, or the powerful or fashionable personage he aped or envied. Both Balzac and Stendhal, these novelists, with the solitary exception of Defoe when he wrote Mole Flanders, are the first to seem continuously aware that the bounds of a personality are not reproducible by a sharp black line, but that each of us flows imperceptibly into adjacent people and things. The characterization of all the novelists who precede these two masters seems, in comparison, incomplete or immature. Even Richardson's seems so. In the most penetrating pages of Clarissa Harlow, even Giles in that uncannily modern novel, The Elective Affinities, because in the case of these writers, the people so elaborately dissected are hung in the void, unvisualized and unconditioned, or almost, by the special outward circumstances of their lives. They are subtly analyzed abstractions of humanity, to whom only such things happen as might happen to almost anyone in any walk of life, the inevitable eternal human happenings. Since Balzac and Stendhal, fiction has reached out in many new directions and made all sorts of experiments, but it has never ceased to cultivate the ground they cleared for it or gone back to the realm of abstractions. It is still, however, an art in the making, fluent and dirigible, and combining a past full enough for the deduction of certain general principles with a future rich in untried possibilities. Okay, happy little pup, it's time for bed now. Sweet dreams. Until next time. Good night.